All right, we, we live. <laughs> Welcome everybody to Cooking It With I Day. It is my pleasure today to be cooking with none other than Matt Barnes. Got to see him ball out on the NBA courts now, enjoying time with his three boys, being a father and an entrepreneur. He wants all the smoke. Uh, <laughs> handling a podcast it's been amazing and so so good to catch those episodes i'm missing them right now i want them to come back matt welcome how are you i'm good i'm good thanks for having me sorry for the uh technical difficulties getting signed on but we're here now but i know life has been good you know uh, like you mentioned uh podcast boys uh other businesses um you know unfortunately through this pandemic it's kind of been the first time i've got to enjoy being home i've Ever since 18, going to UCLA, I've been traveling the world for basketball. So I've finally been able to relax, and I'm enjoying it. Like, I feel like the pandemic pretty much paused everybody. And like you said, like it's giving the opportunity to people that, like yourself, didn't have that chance to really sit your ass down or stay at home. And, and for you as a father with three boys, it's probably been like a complete different world. How have your boys been handling it? Uh, you know, we got to, got to try to stay creative and stay active. Um, this is my 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 off week for my twins, so they're with their mom right now. But um, with my little man, Ash, <laughs> you him all over Instagram. So if he's not in the if he's not in the fridge, he's in the toilet. If he's not doing that, he's in the back drinking hose water. So <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I saw this really cute video that you posted of him. I think it was on your Instagram stories. He was playing with the with the water hose outside, and yeah. then one of them just sprayed him in the face, and he was just like, "Whoa!" Yeah, it was so adorable. He was fascinated by any kind of water, toilet water, pool water, hose water. So uh, you know, just <laughs> that and chasing him around. But like I said, it's it's been fun, and <clears throat> I've really enjoyed it. He needs to start his own podcast called All the Water. You have all the smoke. You have all the water. Can you let everybody know what we're cooking today? Today we are cooking some simple but still delicious uh, chicken tacos uh, recipe that obviously started with my mom, rest in peace, uh, and then my sister passed it down to me. Um, but simple, you know, being Italian and Black, uh, I grew up in a household where, uh, you know, my dad was a butcher. So we always had good meat, although we didn't have much money. We had good meat. And my mom was full Italian, you know, so she was always cooking. So I, I, I learned at an early age to cook, bake, and, you know, work my way around the kitchen. Um, I don't do it as much anymore um, every once in a while, but I can still do it. So today we're going to do it. I'm really excited. When I asked you to come on, you immediately had something ready. You're like, I'm going to make... These chicken tacos I got passed down through my mom. And I appreciate that because I learned to be in the kitchen with my mom. I'm Mexican American and there, it wasn't a choice, okay? I had to like sit there, what we call out cleaning out the beans or the rice and helping her in the kitchen. I never knew like how that would translate to my love for cooking. Like I really, really enjoy it. And food is truly like that universal language and that something that always connects us. So it's beautiful that you do have this recipe and I'm really, really excited to be learning it. I already shredded my chicken. You're <laughs> so, okay. so I'm late, uh, you know, me with split kids, but it's actually cool because I have a cool way of shredding it. Did you shred it like with your fork and take forever shredding it that way? The old Mexican way. And then let, let me tell you, I don't like it. I got, so I got a trick for you. Hold on one second. Okay. We're learning tricks with Matt Barnes in the kitchen. I had to, by hand, um, we call it in Spanish desmenuzar, or in English it's called shred. It's shredded. It, I left a little bit of the broth in there because we're going to need it for the sauce. Some big ass onions in there because I kept those too. So a cheat code to this is... Get yeah, the cheat codes. Shredding it with like a little something you would blend with. So the blend, little blender here will blend up the meat perfectly. So I'll show you. So hold on, let me show you the actual shit wrong side. <laughs> I love it. This is what happens. Right. This is real life cooking right here. Real life. I don't even have one of those. I need to get one. I've been wanting to. These still come in handy when we make cakes and other shit like that. But as you can see, the chicken is still whole right here. So okay, chicken breast. This uh this new thing is gonna shred it for you. That's enough shred for you. I'm gonna laugh. Wow. 
That is definitely the cheat code. I'm a little bit mad. I'm a little bit sour about this. I used to shred that shit forever. I used to, like, my, my mom would bake it, and then she would have me or my sister shred it, and that shit took forever. And then I don't know if my sister found this trick or she found it from someone else, but she's like, you know, you can use a um, a mixer, and it, uh -huh. and, it, and it does the trick in order of the time, so... This mixer's playing games now that it's time to shine. You gotta make sure they're snapped in all the way. Pop them things in there. Oh, there we go. So it probably took you 20 minutes to do it. It's gonna take me, now that I'm rolling, less than five. I am, I'm bitter. <laughs> so bitter my yeah. fingers were burning too because i i like to do it when it's warm because for some yeah. reason it's hot all over your fingers yeah my fingers were red after i was like i can't even feel the fingertips anymore this is a trick for everybody out there yeah. i know you guys know the struggle of having to break apart or shred any type of meat especially chicken it yeah. is a so hot and it is takes forever, but Mad Barnes is letting us know that you can use a mixer to shred your chicken. Do you remember what the first thing, you said that your mom cooked a lot, your dad was a butcher. What was the first thing that you ever made in the um, kitchen? Lasagna from scratch. Lasagna from scratch, how did it come out? It turned out good. Like I said, I obviously had some guidance and I've made it a handful of times since, but you know, like I said, I was fortunate. I'm, I'm nice on the grill and cooking meat, and then I can move into the kitchen, and I have a handful of, you know, things I can make. But like I said, I really don't cook as much anymore because I'm always on the move, so I kind of fall into that order food. Oh, no. People coming over. Let's see. But shredded. Wow. So you learned the trick. All right, so yeah, I'm like mind blowing right now. <laughs> so now we got to put it back in and simmer it with that lat with that one cup of juice you saved from the boil. Okay, so I'm gonna put this on the griddle or on the skillet. Do you remember the first time you had tacos when your mom made it? Um, yeah, I can still remember it. So this has always been one of my favorite recipes. Um, that she cooked. It's simple. It's it's quick. You know, it takes only 30 minutes to get the chicken ready. Um, normally, it took more time to cut the chi or to shred the chicken than it did to cook. But now we low key got a cheat code. Can you see me? It's a little dark on this. Side. A little dark. I'm gonna bring you on this side. So I'm just I'm warming up the chicken again, right, with the broth. Yeah. So you're gonna uh, put the put the broth in it. Okay. The mine is fresh off the steamer. I put a little bit more than a cup just to make sure that the flavor, because you know, flavor is most important. Let's see this. How do your tacos compare to your mama's? Um, shit, nothing's better than my mom or my sister, but I mean, you can't, want, you know, I've cooked it enough now that you can't even tell who's cooked them. So I, I guess I, I've done a, a fairly good job. That's amazing. Um, I lost my mother too when I was 13 years old. Of, she passed away of cancer and I think like now as an adult, something that I really appreciate going back is all the cooking, all the good food, right. all the good food and, and being able to carry that on. Like, I know when I was a kid, like I complained, like I'm not lying. Like I hated being in the kitchen. I hated it. But now as an adult, I like, I look back and I'm like, damn, like she really showed me a lot in that short time that I had her. Yeah. No, it's good. I, uh, condolences. I lost my mom as well to cancer in 2007. Um, so it's a little thing, you know what I mean? Little things that they did that sticks with you now, they kind of have you growing for a finer appreciation, especially when you start cooking shit to taste good. You know what I mean? That's what we so now I'm going to add the fajita mix to the, uh, to the chicken. Moving slow. We need a mix. Mm -hmm. All right. Now you mix that mix in. You said this is your off week from the twins? Yeah, well, actually, I get them. So um, 
we just got into an AAU tournament in Las Vegas. So actually their mom is flying them back to me because they went to the Bay where she's okay. from with her parents. So they're coming back to me today and then we're flying to Vegas today at 530 because we have a tournament that starts uh, tomorrow that I coach them in. How long, how long have they been back to to playing ball with other kids? Has it been a while or is this, this going to be this tournament going to be the first time they're going back? This will be the first time since uh, we shut down. So first time since mid-February, I think we played a tournament. So How? Know, I'm always someone that eats. I, you know what? I've, I've been seeing them. Like, I feel like they're always working out. They work out way more. <laughs> they work out way more than I do or most adults that I know, actually. They look like they're really serious about the game. How does that feel for you to see both of your boys have such a passion? And it even looks like Ash is already starting to pick it up. You know, it was something for me where I'm very against parents vicariously living through their kids and forcing them to do shit they don't want to. Yeah. Fortunate enough, you know, the twins got to travel with me my last three or four years when I won a championship with Golden State. They were on the team plane, team bus, team hotel, practice. They got to be around it. But I still didn't want to force them. You know, all kids want to do now is play on their iPads and play video games. So, oh, I was like, hey, you, you know, you know what it's going to take to get there but I was never going to force them. So for their 10th birthday, um, rest in peace to my brother, Kobe, I surprised them with the workout. Um, and Kobe worked them out for their birthday. <clears throat> and he told me, like, you know, they work hard. Are they into it? I'd be honest, bro, they're good, but they don't work because they'd rather play video games. So Kobe got on their ass that day, and that stuck with them, and it kind of started a fire. And then, unfortunately, when Kobe passed um, earlier this year, um, the boys dedicated themselves, saying they're going to start working their asses off for Kobe. So since, you know, the end of January, they've really been on it. And it's been amazing because this is the first time we're really starting to work out. And, and you, the, their improvement day by day has been amazing. You know, they're so skilled that um, I just love seeing them excel and, and doing something they want to do. Like I said, I'm not, whether it was sports or whatever, I was going to support them regardless, but I never wanted to force them to do what their dad did. And, uh, you know, they found that love and passion themselves, which is great. And I'm going you know, to work their ass off now. I think that's so beautiful. That's a, it's a great story too. They really capture that mama mentality. And, you know, you, you did talk about their birthday and getting to work out with Kobe. What was that conversation like, Matt, with your kids having to tell them what happened to Kobe earlier this year? I can't even begin to imagine. Yeah, it was really tough. We were actually at my house up in the Bay Area because we had a Bay Area tournament. So I had the whole team. It was like a dad trip. So all the dads, um, I, I rented big minivans and every week drove the kids up um, to my place in the Bay. It was championship Sunday and I was down with some of the dads in the lower part of the house while the kids were up there playing video games and we were smoking and one of the dads jumps up and says like, no way. I'm like, what's going on? He's like, Kobe's dead. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? <clears throat> Next thing I know, I turn on the news and you know, I saw what everyone else saw and I was it shocked, devastated. I couldn't move. I was frozen for like 45 minutes. Um, I go back upstairs to the very top of the game room of the house, and I go look at the boys, and they had already seen the news by then. But the twins obviously having such a huge connection with them. You got to think I met Cove, <clears throat> or excuse me, the twins met Cove when they were three. That's when I started playing with Cove. So he took them in, always had them in the locker room, always gave them shoes, was kind of like Uncle Cove. You know, so obviously it hurt them tremendously and, and obviously the rest of the team tremendously. The crazy thing about it was he had sent his latest shoe that he had just re-released. That shoe mm -hmm. came to my house Tuesday and he died mm -hmm. on Sunday. So he sent the last shoe. The undefeated ones that came out? Yeah, the, the, the re yeah, the, the, yeah. The, 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 the older ones. Yeah. Yeah, he had sent those shoes to so the whole boys, the, the, the whole team and had their shoes on that weekend just because COVID just sent them. And, um, you know, so the team decided to, to, to dedicate 2020 to him. So as we stand, we haven't played since the end of February, but we're 20 and 0 this year in honor of Cove. So our goal is to be undefeated this year uh, for Cove. So we're going to pick that up this weekend in his honor. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to that too. I'm going to have to follow up and ask you how that went. And speaking about Kobe, Matt, I think there is a moment that I have to ask, and I'm pretty sure you've talked about it with other people, but I haven't gotten a chance to talk about it with you. But what the fuck were you thinking when you did that fake pass in front of Kobe's face? And I think a lot of people, when I saw that, Matt, honestly, I was watching that game. People hated me after that. People hated me. 
the, you know, you're, uh, you know the, the Latino community is huge for their LA sports, and obviously you can't do shit to Kobe. So when I no. not like when I did that shit, I got death threats. Like you better not come back to LA. We're gonna kill you. Fuck this. Fuck that. But um, how it started was, you know, Kobe and I are competitors. I met Kobe in '98 when I came to UCLA. Um, he, uh-huh. came, he came to the Lakers in '96. But a lot of people don't know Kobe didn't play right away. You know, mm-hmm. so he was always up on our UCLA campus, walking around working out after our practices. So sometimes I'd sneak back into our gym and watch him work out. I'm just like, damn, this motherfucker's good. How's he not playing in the NBA? So slowly but surely, over my college career, obviously he started playing and doing his thing. So he was always someone I admired for his work ethic because I saw behind the scenes how hard he busted his ass. Uh, Fast forward to me making the league. Uh, He was just always someone I was just like, you know, he's the barometer. I missed Michael Jordan by one year. So to me, Kobe was my mic. You that's know, what that's what I say. He was someone I always wanted to measure. You know, if you can slow code down, you're doing something. You know, so it was always a battle. Anytime we had linked up, and then this particular situation in Orlando was towards the end of the season, getting ready for the playoffs. And one thing about people don't know about Kobe is he's a mental fucking monster. You know what I mean? So he wants to destroy you every way possible. He doesn't just want to bust your ass on the court. He wants to mentally make you mad does little shit like he always is elbowing grabbing taking deep shots but cussing you out probably <laughs> so slick that no one ever sees and you always, you know the old additive you always get caught when you react to it so i was yeah. reacting like he would elbow me and then i'd push him and they call a foul on me i'm like what the fuck you didn't see what you know so it was just that kind of back and forth atmosphere and it was like a point where i was like man fuck this we're about to fight you know what i mean so the ball fake thing was i don't even know where it came from to be honest with you like it just happened but the fact to see that it got, you know, within inches of his face and he didn't flinch was uh, Woo. crazy. But what a lot of people don't know is that was the end of the season. They went on and won the championship. We lost to the Celtics in the Eastern Conference Finals. And then the Lakers beat the Celtics that year. Um, but that summer, I was uh, in the process of actually leaving Orlando, going to Miami. So that's the year that Braun and uh, Bosch were going to Miami. So I was going to go from Orlando just right up the freeway to Miami. So I was talking to Pat Riley, D-Wade, like, hey, you know, we got these guys coming. It will be, a, you know, a killer closer lineup, so, so, so. And then one day out of the blue, I get a call from a number that I don't even know. And anyone who knows me, I don't pick up my phone even if I know you most of the time. I just, I'll text you. <laughs> and for some reason, I picked up this number, and it was Kobe. I'm like, who? He's just like, it's Kobe. I'm like, yeah, fucking right. He's like, no, I'm serious. He started laughing. So we kind of started going back and forth. He's like, you know, what are you doing this, you know, next season? I'm like, I don't know. You know, I'm just – fell through with Orlando, I'm probably gonna go to Miami. He's like, anyone crazy enough to fuck with me is crazy enough to play with me. Do you wanna be a Laker? I'm like, hell yeah, like I grew up a Laker fan. I'm from Cali through and through. So I'm like, hell yeah. So for to me, the greatest Laker to call me up and say, you know, come play with me. I think it just was a sign of how much we respected each other's competitiveness and, and how hard we went at each other. And then, you know, obviously from there is when we became teammates is when we became brothers. You know, we were inseparable on and off the court. We hung out all the time. We were both going through stuff in our personal life. So we leaned on each other and hung out a lot. Um, I told a story one time that he didn't really go out that much. But of all places, I got him to go out in Milwaukee with me one night. <laughs> and we went to this little nasty ass bar and, and had drinks. So that was like my brother, man. So we, like I said, so when the twins met him, it was always just Uncle Cove. Every time they would see him, he'd show him love. He would bring him down to the stand and come down on the court to talk to him during warmups and shit. So it was devastating for myself and obviously with everyone and, and the twins too, when, you know, we lost code. So, um, you know, I just try to, as a father and a man, as a businessman, continue to honor him and, and give my fullest to every day. And I love the fact that my kids and their team are, are inspired obviously by his, what he did in the past, but to honor him uh, moving forward. So, They've been working their asses off, long story short, because of COVID. So I love it. Man, that is a, so, so beautiful to hear. And yeah. it really was like when Kobe Bryant passed away, it felt like we all lost a, a family member, you know? And I, I only think about people that actually had the pleasure to really have those conversations and have that brotherhood with them in real life. And, and I really uplift everyone in prayer because it hurts. Like, okay. it, there are some days where like I just think about him and I'm like, damn, my heart just I can feel it like it really, really hurts. But the the I would say silver lining in it is the inspiration that has come out of it, you know, and how loved he was and how that is going to be carried on, even in your boys. 
yeah. as you're saying that, that just you see, seeing the whole spectrum from little kids to older people, that love, I think, really transcends. And it's that energy that carries on. And losing my mom, I think something that I've learned is that someone passes away, we lose them maybe physically, we lose the body, right? But that spirit, that energy, the memories, that all continues to live on as long as we keep them in our heart, in our memories. And I think it's important to talk about them. That's how they still continue to live on. And and like you said, like the boys wanting to win for him and being inspired by him, those are little things and turn out into a really big thing, so. Yeah, and, and, and you know, to losing my mom too, it was tough. You know, when you lose someone that close, obviously he wasn't family, family by blood, but he was family by, you know, relation. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what helped me get over my mom's death, which was devastating to me as well, was talking about it. You know, remembering the good times, remembering everything they stood for in a positive light, and and that's something you know for Kobe. You know, I was always someone who was on him because. He's such a dope dude, but he had such a crazy, like, mixed reputation because he came into the league early, you know what I mean? So he didn't get to go to college and mature and come into the league as a man. He came into the league as a boy, you know what I mean? So there were some growing pains, and you would hear things about Kobe, but then you're just like, no, that's not the dude I know. You know, that's not the dude I know. So when I got a chance to play with him and saw how cool he was and talk shit and cracking jokes on each other, I used to hit him like, yo, why don't you show the world this person? You know, this kind of pre-social media, this was just the only time you saw Kobe was playing or in interviews, and that's all you really saw. So come around social media, you know, 2010, 2011, when it kind of started heating up a little bit, I'm just like, you know, you need to show the world this, this cool-ass motherfucker we see every day. You know, and I was happy that, you know, he kind of started opening up more and, and, and showing the other side of Kobe, you know, the the, 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 the businessman, the husband, the entrepreneur, um, all the motivation, you know, all the books he was writing for children just to show how well-rounded and, and what kind of guy he was. So it was an honor to get to know him for shit, half our lives. And like I said, I met him at, at 18 when he was 20 and, uh, you know, he passed at 41 and I just turned 40. So it was an honor to get to know him for, uh, you know, half my life and really become family um, over the last 10 years. So obviously rest in peace, uh, condolences to the family still. Vanessa and those girls are so strong. Uh, you know, Shea, his sisters and Sharia, Joe and uh, Pam out in Las Vegas. Um, you know, we, we lost, I think the world lost, you know, a basketball player, but LA lost a superhero. Yeah, definitely, man. I, I couldn't have said it beautiful, more better myself. And thank you for sharing that part of you. You know, I know that it's not easy, but you were talking about being in the NBA and reputations too. You know, do you feel that you had to struggle with that part too, with your career, with dealing with either misconceptions or maybe things that were on headlines. I think a lot of people that are in the limelight to some capacity, whether you're an artist, an athlete, whatever it is, an actress, that there's just things that get thrown out by the media or something that gets built about you that really isn't there. Yeah, no, it's unfortunate. You know, there's huge misconceptions and I'm sure I'm not the only one, like you said, but there was a misconception of just who I was. And, um, you know, luckily through social media and then people just kind of getting to know me better, they found out that this thing, you know, the brush they tried to paint me with was, was was the wrong color. But I learned early on because it used to bother me. You know, people like, fuck this guy. And, and like, especially after I did the shit with Kobe, like it was almost like I became the bad guy. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone thought they fuck this thug and this, this and that. And it was a little frustrating at the beginning. But then at the, uh, you know, probably around 2011, I just started embracing it. Like, fuck it. They want me to be the bad guy. They need bad guys just like they need good guys. You know, so an interesting story was uh, my kids used to travel with the team. So we would start going to arenas and when they were announced by name that, you know, the, the other crowd that the crowd would boo when they would do starting lineups and the twins are like, you know, why are they booing you? And I'm like, shit, how do I explain this to them? And they loved wrestling at the time. So it's just like, you know, daddy's kind of like the undertaker. I come in wearing the black cloak and everything and whoever I'm guarding is like Hulk Hogan because I always guard the best player. So it's just like, you know, I'm the bad guy, but they need bad guys just like they need good guys. They're like, so you're not really bad. Right. And I'm like, no, you, I'm your dad. You think I'm bad? They're like, no, then, so they're like, so the fans don't know what they're talking about. I'm like, the fans only boo me because I do a good job at what I'm doing. You know, my job is to guard Kobe, to guard Melo, to guard KD, to guard D Wade. I always had to guard the best players. So obviously when we go into opposing arenas, they don't like me. And and I talk a lot of shit when, when needed and I'll fight in a heartbeat. So there's obviously a lot of reasons for people not to like me. But, you know, luckily through social media and, and post career, I've kind of been able to show who I was. I was just a super competitor. I was down to fight, do whatever to win. 
and now post career kind of people got to you know get to see the father the you know the philanthropist the businessman and you know all the other kind of stuff that i'm into and and, and kind of shedding my old image i think that's also a part of you growing and people are allowed to grow as well right. you know becoming who you fully are from whatever misconceptions that people think like you said about kobe you know people don't get to see this side people only build or read headlines and then create this image of somebody and carry that with them without giving them that chance where are we in the tacos because okay, I, so I, just, I just simmered my meat for about 10 minutes so my <laughs> shit is good and let me taste it real quick to make sure it's as flavorful as it looks and delicious i know we're ready to go um Obviously, getting to the NBA, I feel, or just becoming a professional athlete, a lot of kids dream of that. Yeah. When, when you were a kid, did you already have it set in your mind, like, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a pro basketball player? I was actually a football fan. Football is my first sport. So I was um, all American in football in high school, the number one receiver in the country, recruited everywhere to play football, but just started kind of thinking about, okay, well, if I have a possibility to make the NFL or the NBA, what career is going to last longer? Which money is guaranteed? Um, you know, so I'm not someone that says, hey, I could have did both, but I was someone that really could have played professional football as well. But at the time, you know, being 6'8", there's not too many 6'8 receivers. And if I did, you know, make an impact, they would have tore my big ass up. So going into UCLA, I just decided to stick with basketball. It was, it was a tougher for me. I had to work harder at it but it was more of a challenge. Football was natural. So uh, I grew up wanting to be a football player and uh, ended up being a basketball player. Wow, I didn't know that at all. You know what it reminded me of? I don't know if you've gotten a chance, but J. Cole recently wrote this piece called The Audacity in the Players Tribune, I believe. Uh -huh. um, and it is so good. He talks about you know wanting to at first become a professional basketball player. And he talked about his sophomore year waking up and it was where trials had happened, right? Mm -hmm. It was like 6 a.m. or something, and I think he had to be there by like 6.15. And he was laying there in bed, like really thinking like, do I chase this dream of becoming a, a professional basketball player because I'm good at it and right. I have an opportunity, or do I continue to chase my rap dreams? But he said he wanted to be like the best of the best, and he felt that he could be the best at his rap career so that's what he chose but it ends like it talks about like the highs and lows falling in and out of love with rap and still considering throughout his career oh i still have time to join right. the nba it's a really dope piece you should read it one of my favorite artists and i love you know how deep and, and dope he is uh you know i think he just dropped a couple songs uh today but i i struggled with the same thing to be honest because my first four years i didn't really get a chance to play i bounced from team to team so there was a point in 2006 where um, my brother was playing football in college just about, and then he went and played in the CFL. But I was, so I was still doing summer workouts, football workouts, and basketball. So there was a point uh, going into the 2006-07 season where I was just like, fuck it, if it doesn't work, I have my agent that lined up about eight NFL teams were going to give me a private work, and I was going to try to go play football. I think at that point I was 26. 26. Wow. And, um, you know, luckily that season worked. That was the We Believe season with the Warriors in 2007. We made NBA history, but that's kind of when I found my niche in the NBA. But I was on that same thinking, like, fuck, okay, well, basketball's not really working. And it is what it is. I'm going to go play football. But, uh, you know, ended up sticking with basketball and, you know, making a 15-year 15, 15 career out of it. So it was a, it was a blessing. It wasn't bad. How it turned out to be lucrative. It's lucrative uh, a sport for you. That's really amazing. And now... Well... Now, now off the court, you're still continuing to grow, I feel, and venture into new things, like even having your own podcast, which is amazing. It's so good. I was like, damn, Matt could really do this. Like, this is really good. <laughs> Who knew? Yeah. So talented and skilled. How was that for you and, and getting into that space? Uh, it, it was luck, really. You know what I mean? I had no intention on, you know, I'm someone who had my face on the camera or on the television screen since I was 18 for a lot of good shit and a lot of bad shit too. So I was kind of just tired of being that way. I, my, my goal post career was to be behind the scenes, learn how to direct uh, and produce shows. Um, I started doing ESPN and Fox and it was getting, you know, good feedback. Like, hey, you really know how to talk the game. You should think about doing this for real. And then, uh, you know, at, at, at the same time, my brother, Steven Jackson was doing the same thing back and forth, Fox and ESPN. And, 
we loved our realness and, and 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 the way we spoke intelligently about the game. So one day we were uh you know after work we, we were both walking work blocks that day. We were smoking and I'm just like you know we need to do a show together. I'm like this is dope, but you know I'm signed with ESPN, which is Disney. So you kind of got to walk that line. Right. Work with, you know similar situation. I'm just like we need to do something where we can really be us. And he's like, what? I was like, shit, how about a podcast? I didn't even know what a podcast was. And to be honest with you, I've only watched two of our episodes. We yeah. have 45 episodes. I've only watched two of them, one being Kobe. And then the last Jamie Foxx episode we dropped. So I'm still not really even in the podcast, to be honest with you. But it's just something that we kind of stumbled upon and found out we were good at. And we're making it happen. So right now, we're negotiating our contract for season two, which should be done. I'm excited mm-hmm. to announce who we're going to be with. Um, we picked up a new partner. This year, so I'm excited to probably announce that either in the next week or the week after. But we'll be back on air probably um, middle of next month or beginning of uh, September. So it's like I said, it stumbled. It was organic. It was a lot of luck, but uh, it ended up working out. No, it's it's really really. I'm excited to come back. You guys have great that people that you have together. It's been great. Are you hearing a? You're kind of cutting out a little bit. Let me make sure my That's Wi-Fi so still. That's so weird. I just started so weird. weird. Yeah, my Wi-Fi is working. Is yours all right? My, I'm connected. My, I'm connected. What are you drinking? Water. <laughs> Water. Oh, you, you, you inspired me. Hold on a second. All right. You're like, what the hell are you? Like, what the hell are you? What's going on over there? What's going on over there? Maybe I'm just hearing the echo. Maybe I'm just hearing the echo. A little echo, but it's all right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna see what you wow. Hold on one second. Why is my audio tripping? People watching, can you let me know how my audio sounds? Can you guys hear me okay? Huh, now I don't hear it. Hmm. I'm new. You guys can hear me okay? Mamba824 just said yes. You can hear me okay. So I'm not echoing crazy. The echo is gone now, better now. It was echoing, but not anymore. Great. Thank you guys. Rolling, we good? We good. What did you get to drink? I didn't get nothing to drink. I got something to smoke. Ah, I'm, st- I'm so jealous. I don't have anything. <laughs> Of course, of course you would. Where are we at with the tacos? We're ready. My griddle's on high. My meat is ready. And I have another kind of cheat sheet. So I use like this pancake griddle. Can you see it? Yeah, you got all the connects. Okay, yes, I know. I've seen those before. Yeah, so all you do here from now, so I can do multiple. I can probably do six at one time. So I'm going to pour a little oil. Actually, hold on. Let me get my meat. I got a good ocomal. This is what I have. I already... And my tortillas got stuck on it, so this is why you're seeing all these little tortilla marks on it. Yep. So. Okay. Yeah, we so add the oil. Oil. So the secret to these, which people don't know, I gave you the little cheat code with the um, with the with the blender to blend the chicken, and then the other cheat code is this Parmesan cheese, which is just unbelievable. Once you put it on the shelf, fresh off the griddle, you can thank me later for it. Okay. Let's see. Putting some oil. I hope I didn't put too much oil. Well, you'll be all right. But you can use the oil for other ones. I use this clean napkin to spread this and take some of the oil off. So I feel like I put way too much oil on this. You're all right, because you can, you can dip it in the other ones. Okay. You want to start frying them. It's hot. So put them back on there? Yeah, fry them. Okay. That should be super hot. So One of the people that are watching said, Mamba824 said, I seen Matt once at an In-N-Out. 
I'm everywhere. You know, I'm, I'm someone that never took myself too serious. Um, so I'm, I do my own grocery shopping. You know, obviously I go to in and out every once in a while. Um, I'm, I'm regular. I never looked at myself as, you know, I need someone to go do shit for me. <clears throat> I clean my own house. I saw it made, but I clean my own house. I wash my own clothes. I'm, I, I try to be as regular as possible. I love that about you. You're super humble. I think that when I got a chance to meet you, that's something that I learned too, because when we were talking about earlier about like misconceptions or whatever it may be, I didn't know you were so cool. And when I met you, I was like, yo, like he's really dope. And what I really enjoy the most about you is how real you are. You are somebody that's just authentic to me in my eyes. And you're a Pisces. So, I mean, come on. It only makes sense. It only makes sense. You know, I just think some people take themselves too serious. You know, life is short. Enjoy it. Be cool. Because I think it takes, so to me, it's a lot easier to be cool than it is to be an asshole. It takes a lot of effort to be mean to people and be an asshole all the time. Like, being cool should be natural. So, that's kind of Wait, just what you put the at. cheddar cheese or you put Parmesan cheese on them? I put cheddar on that. So, I put the cheddar inside. Okay. Once I toast the outside. And then I put okay. the meat on top and then let it melt in a little better. Okay. So that you get that nice light golden oh, way I gotta go. Brown. Flip them. As you see, I'm very hands-on. I just be touching shit, flipping it like this. <coughs> Flip them. Get them both sides. Hot, hot, hot. Hot, hot. Shit is hot. They're a hot. What do you think about the NBA bubble, Matt? Are you excited for season excited. to start again? I'm excited that you know the season's coming back. I'm excited that they're keeping obviously the message going because the world is fucked up right now, so we don't ever want to lose track of that. But I think the NBA and the players have done a good job of uh, you know keeping the message going, which is very important to me. Uh, here's an important part right now. You guys need to pay attention, whoever's watching. So we got it fresh off the griddle. Okay. And you're gonna dip it. I'm gonna put the farmer jar right here. You roll them in Parmesan, it's fresh off the griddle. Roll them in Parmesan, fresh off the griddle. Okay. So I have my Parmesan here. I'm going to put it in here. Yeah, put it on the plate, flip them, get it on there. And then voila, you got built in crack. <laughs> so the, the best, the trick with these though, is you got to eat them while they're hot. For real. Hey, I mean, but mine didn't, the Parmesan is not sticking on it. So you should have let the oil, you should have had more oil. That's why I said go ahead and put the oil on there. So you fry them. Yeah. Put the oil on there. So it's all right. You try your next one. Hot. Turn this shit off. It's burning me. Okay. All right. Let's try it with the second one. I still don't think this is oily enough now. Let's see. Failure. <laughs> see, I missed it, and I just messed it up. What the hell? It's not working? No, it won't stay on them. I mean, put it on or rub it on with your hand, too. You can kind of low-key force it on there a little bit. But that's why the key is to get, make sure you get your griddle oiled up nicely. Okay, look, at now I'm like salt bay, except I'm cheese bay with this. Boom. Okay, now what? You got it on there? Yeah, I yeah. put it on now put your fixing on there. I'm simple. All I, all I do from here is put hot sauce on mine. But you could put you could put guacamole, you could put tomatoes, you could put lettuce, whatever you need. I want to try it just like this with a little bit of sour cream. That's what I want to try. Sour cream. I'm gonna put sour. I'm gonna put. You're right. I'm gonna put sour cream and hot sauce on mine. I was making some fresh salsa, but then I stopped. My chiles are in the oven. That's my trick. Okay. I. We used to, we, growing up, you get the chiles ready and the tomatillos by putting them on like a skillet or whatever and letting them like kind of roast. Uh -huh. But I use a broiler and if you broil them, it makes it super easy. Oh, I'll nice. Show you. See, I had started this earlier. I'll show you what it looks like. I'm not gonna make it because I can't even reach my blender. So if you, oh shit, this better not spill everywhere. So this is what they look like once they get roasted. Oh, those are the the and they're dripping. They're what dripping. Your juice. What was that? Those just straight. I can't. Is there stuff on them? 
No, so this is basically the tomatillos and it's a, ha a jalapeno and a, um, and a serrano pepper. And all you do, you put it in the broiler. They were toasted because the, they were broiled. So then you just put that in the blender with some onion, some salt and some cilantro and voila, you have fresh salsa. You gotta get the, uh, make sure the cheese is on yours. Yours sound extra crispy, so they might not have stuck. Yeah. Um, it's a thin line between like getting them nice and light golden so that they don't go all the way to hard. And then the, at, and right before that stage is when you can get the cheese to stick to it. This is really good. Yeah, it's bomb. You know my face is? Yeah, really, really good. Mm. Yeah. Everyone out there likes the recipe. Make sure you like I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make sure to share the same recipe that you sent to me so that people can look yeah. it up. Yeah, yeah. I sent her everything you need from what you need to buy, how to what you need to boil the chicken, uh, boil the chicken with. Like I said, the way I'll give you guys another little lesson on how to get your uh your tacos done yeah, Matt, when you know obviously we're seeing the world we're in really different times right now and when it comes to the nba and we're also now seeing the nfl all of a sudden trying to support um, social injustice right. well i'm glad they're they're trying versus not allowing players to kneel because their stance was completely different a few years ago but i believe in moving forward what do you think about everything that all of these different um, organizations are doing, including when it comes to sports, like the NBA is allowing athletes to use social injustice, different messages on their jerseys. I know that there's been a lot of players that said, you know, we feel limited. Like they give them a list to choose from, which I think is kind of whack in a sense, but still I, I can see limitations, but it's still them trying to do something. Yeah. What do you think about that? And if you were still playing, what would you like what message would you like on your jersey? Um, well, what I think what they're doing is it's heading in the right direction. I agree. I think they should be able to give them some more freedom with what they wanted to say on the back of their jerseys. And I see the Black Lives Matter on the board and all this kind of stuff. And I'm sure they have to make their sleep. But I think more needs to be done. I think they really need to. I think owners need to start, you know, a $100 million fund in every city that a team is in and really give back to these these causes that are obviously vetted and you understand what they're actually doing, but these causes in these minority communities that are underfunded and, and, and underappreciated, you know, whether it be the school system, whether it be, uh, you know, against gang violence, whatever the situation may be, each city has different problems and different issues, but I think these owners need to put like a hundred, each team, 30, 30 teams, there's what, so, you know, a hundred million times 30 teams, and that's how you really start giving back in these communities. You know what I mean? I think the NBA has always done a good job of going back in the communities and doing stuff here and there, but those effects aren't very long lasting. You know what I mean? And, and, and we're on to the next subject. I think with this way, you know, we can get some real change where, you know, money is coming once a month or quarterly and everything. And you know that there's an actual goal to make things better. Um, so, like I said, I think it's a good start. I, I love the fact that the players are continuing to push the messages by their interview. Tobias Harris had a dope ass, you know, justice for Breonna Taylor type yeah. message. Um, and that's all he said. And that's powerful. People are going to remember that. People are going to think of that. And we need to continue to push the issue. Um, but I'm also working on another initiative with some, with some, with some friends um, okay. around, around voting and, and politics. Fun small pieces of content. I think the first post is going to be today. So make sure you guys check that out. The small pieces of content just to kind of teach you an understanding what's going on. Um, I think more than ever, we realize how important our voice is and, and how important this up and coming election is going to be the biggest one of our generation. So we need everybody to come out and not only vote uh, federally, but lo local and statewide. You know, people don't understand that's where all the bills are created and uh, most of them pass is on your local level, which you directly have, a, you know, a chance to vote on. So you get to vote who your mayor is, who your, uh, you know, police district attorney. Is, the man, the district attorneys are so important. District so attorney. important. I can't stress it out enough. People don't realize how yeah. important voting for locally is, and especially when it comes to the district attorney. You know, when recently we've been hearing a lot about, 
defunding the police and all of those things. It's like when you pay attention to what's going on in your government locally, what's happening in, in those elections, it really matters, especially like here in Los Angeles, we have Jackie Lacey, like nobody wants her. Like she's yeah. horrible, but it's, yeah. mad, it's a matter of people paying attention and going and exercising their right to vote or like even something super simple that a lot of people didn't even realize was on a ballot, mm -hmm. the bags. I remember one day my friend was like, why the fuck do I have to pay 10 cents for this bag? I was like, did you vote? You didn't vote for it. There's a lot of little stuff you find that we directly, by going to the polls, what will affect. You know, we can say what we want. Some people cheat to win the presidency, whatever you want to say. We don't really have control over that kind of shit. You know, we still have control from a standpoint. We have to get out and vote. People say, well, I don't like Trump and and um, Biden did all this shit in the past and said this and created this law. I get that. So then people want to say, like, well, I'm not going to vote. And not voting is a vote for Trump. You know, that's what they always depend on us, not voting. And that's how they get a lot, like you just said, something as simple as paying taxes on bags because we don't take the time to know what's, you know, what's in front of us. When people on the other side do, you know, they really, they stick to it. They follow the policy. So that's why they always get everything they want. You mean, because they're up and with it. So I think more than like in the past, it used to be, okay, I don't understand what's going on. Pilot voting's not me. I, I used to get that. But now you've seen what Trump has done to this country and how divided we are. Like now is the time to come together. They said there was 102 million people who were eligible, uh, eligible in 2016. It didn't. 102 million did not. It's it's such a waste. I think a lot of people also believe this thing of, oh, my vote doesn't matter. But what I keep on saying is if your vote did not matter, do you think that they would spend as much money as they do on campaigning if your vote did not matter? Like, that's what they want you to believe. But that's not true, because think about everything that goes on. Of course, your vote matters. Of course, your voice matters. And you're talking about, you know, all the divide that they, they want and something that I'm seeing a lot in the streets and I really appreciate that you posted about it. And I think that it's not, it's not something that's an overall thing that's happening, but it is going down. Um, we have been seeing a lot of street vendors being attacked, especially here in LA and even in other states like Texas, we've seen them getting robbed, beat up, ending up in hospitals and some even passing away. Um, and I saw that you posted about it. So I really appreciated that you did. You know, I've I've gone into many, many conversations with people because it's hard. It really is hard. I'm Mexican and I'm getting so many different messages from the Latino community. Like, look at this shit, look at this shit. And my message still stands, you know, because I looked at one and there was just so many comments in there that were horrible. One, I was already heartbroken and I was angry and I was devastated by what I saw in the video, what happened to the street vendor. Nobody, nobody, I don't care what you are, who you are as a person should be treated like that. So I was already tripping out on that. And then I go into the comments and then I see my own people being racist and saying all kinds of shit that doesn't make right what happened in that video or what's going on. And then I was getting called out, like people were like, well, you're, you care more about the racist comments that were made towards the black community than what's happening to the Latino in the video. Like, nah, don't get it twisted, okay? But wrong and wrong don't match either way. What happened in that video and being attacked and that that went on wasn't right at all. And I'm not condoning that. Just like I'm not condoning the racism and the dumb shit that you're saying in the comments. Like, what do you mean? I don't believe in hate drowning out hate. Like, that's not the way it works, but we need more than ever is unity, especially between black and brown. And I think that that's what they want. They want to see us divided because together we really are more powerful. They have no, that, that's my whole message is I get there's been a history of black and browns not liking each other. And it's probably for some bullshit, to be honest with you, to begin with. But now we're to the point where, you know, <clears throat> this street vendor shit is ridiculous. I had to say something. But it's just like I said, back to your point, <clears throat> if we understood how powerful the black and brown community together would be and how we can really change the world, <clears throat> we need everybody to be on board. But if black and brown came together first, I think it was an amazing example. And we, we understand our power in voting, understand our power in our communities, working together to, to, to fix the shit because now we're fine. We, we're already, I mean, it's blacks and then Mexicans are right at you guys are right after us as far as the, the way 
certain people look at us and, oh, and, yeah. and us. you know what I mean? So why the fuck are, there's a real enemy out there and we're not going to beat them with violence. We're going to be with voting in our minds, but there's a real enemy out there. So, but you, we want to fight against each other. Mm -hmm. That's not the answer. Instead of being like, yo, this is exactly what the fuck they want. You know what I mean? We're doing the dirty. We're knocking each other off for them. You know what I mean? And then they talk about the black on black crime and black on black crime. Is, crime is proximity. You're going to kill who you're around. So right. there's Mexican on Mexican crime, Asian on Asian crime, white on white crime. So there's a lot of different stereotypes that we just if we understood first and foremost as our own culture. I think one of the uh, our the black culture's biggest weaknesses is coming together. Yeah. Always on different islands. I think that's one of our biggest weaknesses. Um, so if we can come together from that standpoint and understand there's a real enemy, um, and then look to, 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 to you know to, to to mend the bridge with the, with the, with the brown community. You know what I mean? Because like I said, look at me. I'm black, but people look at me. People think I get all the time confused for you know some kind of you know Latin heritage. So we look like each other. We we live the same way. We've been through this, you know some of the same bullshit. Like why are we fighting each other? We need, yeah. to, we need to be educating ourselves and fighting the real enemy. That's that's what I say all the time. And even being when even being Latina, being Mexican, like I realized that I had white privilege because of my skin color, because I'm a lighter Latina. Like I didn't realize it until I believe I went into the store with my younger brother one day and he has more of a darker complexion than I do. He's lucky because my colonizers then took all my melanin out of me. Then they treated him different. Like I went in and they're like, Werita, which is like the term which is basically white girl type of thing, you know, mm -hmm. praising me for my skin and then treating him a different way because of his skin. And I was like, yo, like this is some bullshit. And it, it really, really sucks. But yeah, the matter is like coming together is the important message overall. I'm going to let you get going back to your boys. Well, actually to Ash because you, the twins aren't there, but back to your family. But before I let you get off, Matt, I want to know if you could give a young Matt Barnes any piece of advice, what would that be? Hmm. Hold on one second. I got to close the gate. If I can give my younger self advice. I just wish, I, it, it, it would be hard because I think this just comes with age is just understanding your surroundings. You know what I mean? I wish I would have got, I got into the activism, this stuff around 2017, like when I retired, because I had more time, but I wish I would just would have been educating myself more and sooner because people platforms have tremendous outreach. You know what I mean? When you understand what's going on in this world and understanding, even if you're not me, even if you're someone with just a platform, we can really help affect change, you know? So I wish that I would have got on that bandwagon earlier and, and had more of an understanding um, with that. But, you know, I hope that, you know, what we're doing is gonna spread like wildfire because, you know, someone like you, Big Boy, myself, LeBron, when we talk, people listen. And when we're all talking on the same page as far as what's right in, 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 in fixing this country, we can change anything. You know, so, you know, the black and brown's got to come together. To me, the way I look at it, it's got to be everybody versus hate. I mean, mm -hmm. this is a crazy time, and hate comes in all colors, shapes, and forms. We have black people that hate their own race and other races. Mexicans do the same. So it's not just white people. You know, mm -hmm. there's good people and bad people in every, uh, uh, and, and they come in every color. But at the end of the day, it just has to be all of us versus hate. You know what I mean? You got to keep calling them out. Some people got to get fucked up. That's just what it is. But we have to keep putting them on blast because that's the one thing that has is why the culmination of 400 plus years of where we're at today is because. Yeah. So yeah. I won't get long winded. Someone's at my door, but thank you for the, it. Was, it was cool. Hopefully we can do this one time in person tonight and we can uh, really eat food and, and uh, do it again. I would love that. Thank you so much for joining us today, Matt. Take care. God bless you. You got to take care.